life and death issues, whether it's uh, the climate resiliency challenge that new vehicles are going to have to help us address and overcome, or the life and death on the safety of, of the roadways. Uh, this is really why somebody like Toyota has stepped up to create uh, a startup, a different kind of startup than these two startups. Uh, the Toyota Research Institute, based here in Palo Alto with uh, uh, three other offices around the world, uh, led by an amazing team of people uh, like Dr. James Kuffner, who's coming up in a moment. Uh, Dr. Kuffner came out of uh, Stanford University, uh, PhD computer science program, uh, is the father of something that uh, almost none of us have ever heard of called cloud robotics that I hope we'll learn a little bit about in a few minutes, but really is, is helping as chief technology officer at uh, Toyota Research Institute to guide us into the world of, of uh, both assistive technology where the machine and the human being are engaged with each other and the fully autonomous future. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Kuffner. Floor is yours and here's your, uh, here's your device. Well, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with this uh, audience this morning. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the work uh, that we're doing at the Toyota Research Institute. For those who uh, uh, don't know about us, we were uh, founded uh, about nine uh, months ago, and uh, our um, CEO, Dr. Gil Pratt, uh, was a DARPA program manager uh, and also an MIT professor, and uh, our goal is uh, really to partner with academic institutions in the field, uh, as well as um, our industrial partners and the Toyota family of companies, uh, and, and also with uh, government, to, to help uh, bring in new technologies related to advanced safety and development. Uh, our key focus areas are, of course, automotive safety and autonomy, but we're also looking at exploring new forms of mobility um, and some of you may get to ride the iRoad outside, uh, but, but also uh, in the robotic space. Uh, and, and other uh, uh, philosophy of our development is to uh, leverage modern state-of-the-art cloud computing and software tools to uh, explore new forms of energy as well as battery technology and materials that uh, could help uh, transform next generation of, of mobility solutions. So a lot of uh, Silicon Valley companies uh, talk about moonshot research. Uh, I was part of Google for seven years. And uh, you know, the focus is really on trying to uh, find technology leaps. And how to do that is, uh, is still, I think, an, an unsolved problem. But we know some of the ingredients. And let's just take, for example, uh, a topic that uh, of course, uh, myself and many of us at Toyota care deeply about is the historical precedence of the car. So in 1885, we had the first gas-powered engines. Of course, they tended to explode and were not very safe, and they were very expensive. Um, but uh, the next uh, 20 to 30 years, there was incredible advancement in transmission designs, and of course, manufacturing technology really brought the cost down to the point where it was possible for people to personally own vehicles. And of course, that absolutely changed the world. And in fact, all of our cities are designed around cars. Many people have said that if aliens uh, observed our planet from afar, they would say that it is populated by metal beings with four wheels and every once in a while some carbon-based prototypes would ex enter and exit these metal-based vehicles. Um, of course, another historical precedent is the computer. In 1945, we had very expensive, kind of unreliable vacuum tube-based computers, uh, but over the next 20 to 30 years, you saw rapid advances in hardware, transistors, storage, and displays, and then, of course, in the early 80s, personal computers became widely affordable, and that absolutely transformed our society. And then, of course, there's the transformative shift that all of us have lived through, which is the mobile phone. So back in 1983, if you had $4,000, you could buy this 
pretty big brick uh, uh, that uh, made uh, occasionally good phone calls. Uh, but of course, over the next uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, incredible advances in, in wireless transmission speeds, um, reliability, battery technology, uh, led to the development of smartphones. And of course, smartphones have now overtaken PC desktops worldwide. And in fact, what's in truly incredible is that most likely the phone that you carry in your pocket is more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer of 20 years ago. So what is next? And we think that the confluence of the car, the computer, and connectivity and data in the cloud is uh, going to cause a huge shift. And in fact, uh, cloud-connected intelligent vehicles and robots, we just heard from the panel about the vehicle side. We also think intelligent robots uh, powered by machine learning and AI uh, breakthroughs that have been happening in the last decade are going to be a big thing. And so the Troyta Research Institute is really working hard to try and help uh, explore this area. So when we think about moonshot research and we think about what are the ingredients for disruption, um, I think that it comes down to strong partnerships between academia, industry, and government, uh, plus the presence of a critical mass of people and capital in order to realize it. So for an example, um, the DARPA Grand Challenge was a program where, you know, for two decades, the DARPA had invested in autonomy for vehicles and on really kind of had mediocre results. But instead in, of just funding individual contracts, they sort of flipped it around and said, we're gonna have a prize bounty. And we're gonna encourage anybody who thinks they have a great idea to come and enter a competition and try and build a car that could navigate successfully, uh, autonomously through a desert track. And uh, the first year it was offered, there was no winner. The, the, uh, the entry from Carnegie Mellon, the university that uh, I was teaching at at the time, uh, went the furthest, but it was only about seven miles, of course. But within 12 months, um, several cars win it, w uh, finished the race, including uh, CMU and Stanford's car. And then two years later, uh, they upped the bounty and had it uh, handle urban environments. And then, of course, there were many cars that finished. Uh, Carnegie Mellon was the winner. Uh, and that led to um, the Google self-driving car project. Um, you can see me uh, sitting in one of the Toyota Lexuses that had been outfitted with, with Google software. Uh, and I helped uh, sort of build the initial prototype. And uh, it meant that at that time, the technology was proven enough that companies started to invest in it. And what has been the waterfall in the last seven years is now there's uh, probably, this was in August, there's probably many more now of companies that are working really hard now to bring autonomous vehicles. So this incredible activity in the space is, is truly exciting. And so what does all this mean for our cities? And so let's speculate a little bit on how intelligent vehicle technology could impact the design of future cities. So let's say you were in a world where you could have driverless cities. That means that most of the transportation will be on demand, uh, mobility as a service. Uh, that could lead to a dramatic reduction in overall traffic, noise, and pollution as you have rideshare vehicles that can be uh, fleet managed that are uh, zero emissions, eco-friendly, and of course the utilization of the car is so much higher uh, that you will end up with a reduction of traffic and noise and pollution. Also, as was mentioned before, if most of the vehicles are not parked all the time but actually moving around and the utilization is higher, you should be able to convert a lot of land that's currently dedicated to parking lots into useful residential and commercial areas. This is a problem that the Bay Area faces uh, a lot in that there is no more space left to develop more housing in San Francisco, of course, the desirable place to live, um, but what if you had cars that no longer needed to be parked on the curbside and they could park uh, off-site. And so let's think about today's reality. So right now, when we just think about the, the, the parking, um, the average car is parked about 95% of the time in the, in the US, so only 5% utilization of, of the car. Worldwide, uh, the uh, estimate is that urban drivers spend an average of 20 minutes per trip actually looking for a parking spot. 
And this actually is in contrast, or it seems seemingly contradiction to the fact that the United States has over a billion parking spots for only 253 million cars. Though there's four times more parking spaces than there are vehicles. So uh, how can we uh, better utilize this underutilized resource? And another uh, study showed in, this, in, the, in the county of Los Angeles, there's over 200 square miles of land dedicated to parking. And there's 18.6 million spaces for about 5 million cars. So again, it's roughly 4x, 3.5x. Uh, um, and that's 14% of all the land area in Los Angeles County. So let's think about what happens if an autonomous car can actually drop you off, so at work downtown, and then drive away to an off-site parking garage. So that means that parking structures can be located away from urban centers. There's no need to have a giant parking garage in very valuable real estate in the downtown area. That means you can also have more dense, efficient, packed parking that are managed robotically. Uh, that means that you don't need parking structures that have stairs and elevators and wide alleyways for vehicle access. You can really more efficiently utilize uh, the space. And the system, if it is connected to all the cars, it understands sort of uh, from a machine learning point of view, modeling traffic flows and, and demand curves for a population that is mostly using on-demand mobility as a service systems, that means you could do dynamic load balancing the same way that, that internet routers load balance traffic and packets of information between different servers, you can actually dynamically load balance the, the, the traffic and vehicle flows according to the demand, and even proactively start dispatching cars from the remote, remote garage in order to meet demand and have very low latency. Let's also think about uh, what else parking lots could do. If all of the vehicles are now going towards a, a, a robotically managed, centrally uh, located uh, uh, location for parking, they could also double as charging stations. Then suddenly, if every time the vehicle is parking, it, it automatically recharges itself uh, or refuels itself, you can reclaim the land that is currently utilized for gas stations. Uh, people then potentially charge their cars at home uh, or while the, while the cars are parked. If they're personally owned, they charge at home. If they're, if they're fleet managed vehicles, they charge themselves overnight in the parking structures. Uh, that also means that potentially car services such as cleaning, repairs, safety checks, and maintenance can all be performed at the parking lot facilities uh, in, a central, in a central way and be much more efficient. Uh, you could also imagine that there's so many delivery vehicles currently on our roads today. FedEx, the mail, uh, everyone is getting packages delivered directly to their home, but what if um, the parking garage was smart enough and it became a logistics hub. And now suddenly, uh, when your on-demand ride-sharing car picks you up from work, when you get off work downtown, loaded in the back seat of your car is all the packages you ordered uh, and you take it home. So let's think about urban center redesign. What would be a, a far future? If all the parking lots and gas stations were able to be converted to green spaces, how would that change our cities? Uh, I think many of us would agree that that would be, that would be wonderful. And in fact, um, a lot of the curbside parking spaces that are currently utilized uh, because uh, people want to have cars parked close to where they work uh, could be removed because a car drops you off and then it self parks at a parking facility far away. That means all that space that's dedicated to parking along the curbs could either add another lane of traffic or convert those lanes to nice bike lanes or expanded sidewalks. Um, and so suddenly we not only improve uh, the reclamation of retail, commercial, and residential space in our urban centers, but we're also increasing throughput uh, and, and encouraging more eco-friendly forms of, tr of uh, transportation, such as bicycles and pedestrians. And then you can really think about the far future. It was mentioned that our cities have currently been designed around uh, traditional cars, but intelligent vehicles will enable new forms of design. Um, what if you moved all the vehicle traffic underground? 
And suddenly, all of the above ground streets that are currently used for cars can be converted to the Fußgängerzone. Uh, I, I love this tradition in Europe to have pedestrian only zones in the central part of the city. It's, uh, it's very quiet, uh, there's better air quality, and of course it's much safer. In the United States, the number one cause of traffic fatalities is lane departures, cars going off the road or crossing the yellow line into oncoming traffic. In Japan, it is pedestrian fatalities. And that's because the dense urban centers in Japan and lots of the world, uh, you know, not just Asia and Europe, uh, means that there's very narrow sidewalks or non-existent sidewalks and there's very heavy pedestrian and bicycle traffic in the urban centers. If suddenly all the cars were moved underground, um, then you have a much quieter, cleaner, safer uh, urban center. Um, and it doesn't even have to be that you have to dig these giant tunnels. You could do what Disneyland did, which is uh, Disneyland, of course, as many of you know, has an incredible network of underground tunnels so that Mickey Mouse can go from one place to the other uh, and uh, be in the park at all, at all different times. So they have incredible underground logistics networks supporting the park. Um, but it was actually built on ground level, and they built the park on, on top of level one. That was because of the water table was too low in Anaheim. We could absolutely do the same thing. And in fact, I heard that the city of Amsterdam is now moving all of its roadways to under its canals. So that means that they're, they're digging uh, new roadways to go underneath the existing waterways in the city. Um, and of course, the construction then doesn't disrupt the existing roadways, but all the cars will then be moved to these new underground roadways that run under the waterways. Uh, and uh, then those existing roadways can then be converted to pedestrian zones and bicycle zones, the Netherlands already being an incredible place if you're a bicyclist. So I think uh, this incredible potential uh, will obviously require the cooperation of governments, uh, forward-thinking industry leaders, and, uh, and of course, people uh, in academia who are thinking hard about these problems and being able to do research about it. But I think if, uh, if the society comes together uh, and makes this a reality, we could dramatically improve the quality of life for millions of people around the world uh, as the urban areas are now becoming the place where people live and rural areas are actually losing population. So when we think about uh, you know, a lot of these efforts, there's many ongoing broad initiatives. I have mentioned a couple here uh, of, of, of organizations or private companies and governments that are trying to push things forward and trying to think about some of these issues. Um, uh, I also um, want to highlight what Toyota is doing about it. So uh, some of you have already taken a ride, but if you haven't, you can sign up at the front door to take a ride of a concept vehicle that uh, Toyota is already uh, doing test programs in Grenoble, France, and also Toyota City in Japan. Um, but it's a very, very cool zero emissions electric vehicle with a compact three-wheel design. Um, it has active balancing and stability control, uh, so very, very fun to drive, um, strong and lightweight, and it has uh, batteries that average 50 kilometers on a single charge. Um, it is also um, uh, covered so that uh, unlike a motorcycle where you get wet when it rains, uh, you can stay dry, you can have climate control, and uh, uh, you don't need a helmet. Uh, so please try it out. It's, it's really, really nice. Uh, one of the cool things about this vehicle is that you can fit four of these in an existing traditional vehicle parking space. So you could imagine the incredible density uh, that could be uh, achieved through a, a mobility program like this. Uh, there's versions of the car that can support two passengers, but uh, the, 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 the one outside that you can test drive has a single passenger version. Um, and the sad fact is that in California, if you, at any given time, 93% of the cars on the road have a single passenger in them. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity to dramatically increase the, uh, the existing roadway infrastructure to have many, many more vehicles. Effectively, you can have uh, twice the number of lanes if all the vehicles were this size. Toyota is also investing in true zero emissions uh, future 
for uh, transportation. You can buy today a Toyota Mirai, a, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle that we brought to market, uh, and it has 312 EPA rated miles per tank, and it only takes five minutes to refuel. And wheel to well, it is one of the most environmentally friendly solutions you can build. Uh, it essentially uses the, the hybrid synergy drive, which uh, of course became very popular with our Prius line and our hybrid uh, models. But instead of a gas engine, it uses a hydrogen fuel cell stack. And the only emissions is water vapor. In fact, it's very cool. I've test driven these. They're wonderful cars. You can push the H2O button, and water will come out of the tailpipe. So if you're stuck in the desert, maybe you can get some water <laughs> out of your car. Um, the incredible thing about it, though, is that the car itself, uh, with the fuel cell stack and a, and a tank of hydrogen, could power a, an average home for about a week. So if you, for some reason, are out of power, you could just hook up your home to your car and you have a hydrogen fuel cell stack that can power your home for a week. That's truly off the grid. Um, only takes five minutes to refuel, you can buy it today. There's incredible tax incentives because it is uh, so wonderful for the environment. Uh, of course, there's lots of infrastructure that would need to be built to support this, but if a lot of uh, future mobility solutions are moving towards centrally managed fleets, this actually is very synergistic. The parking garage would simply have a hydrogen fuel station that would then refuel all the cars. So try this out if you haven't test drove a Mirai, it's really, really fun. So when we think about uh, connected cars and uh, the future, we talked a lot about uh, machine learning and data, and I think what's really uh, the promise here uh, in terms of software, um, if you think about big data and deep learning, a lot of the big tech companies, my former employer Google has open sourced. TensorFlow, one of the state-of-the-art algorithms for machine learning, and many other open source solutions now exist for essentially um, extremely powerful machine learning algorithms like Cafe or Torch or Theano. Um, and that means that anyone can use the state-of-the-art algorithms. What is valuable then is the data. And so uh, the data collected from these connected cars is going to be really, really powerful. Of course, it's already demonstrated incredible advances in natural language understanding and speech recognition on our mobile devices. And also, we've now uh, demonstrated uh, through ImageNet and some of our collaborators at Stanford um, have built a project over several years to uh, demonstrate object recognition and semantic labeling that is uh, as good or better than a human. So connected cars will gather novel data. They'll be able to upload new exemplars to a training set. And then in the cloud, we can train these new models and then broadcast updates uh, so that the entire fleet can download uh, a much more reliable and efficient uh, perception system. And that means that recognizing cars and pedestrians can be crowdsourced. And, uh, and that data is going to enable a, an, a much more reliable next generation of these intelligent vehicles. So TRI, uh, the Toyota Research Institute, is, is, uh, is working hard on this. We've just got started uh, in January this year, and we, we now have uh, over 150 employees. We've opened three offices, uh, and we would love to hire anybody uh, else who's interested in working with us. But I want to uh, close with just uh, an example of how a connected car can maintain something that a lot of companies are investing in right now, and that is maps of our road infrastructure. Uh, you know, some companies are, build, are spending uh, billions of dollars to collect data about all of the roads that are in the world. Of course, as soon as you dispatch a car equipped with sensors and you collect that data, that data is immediately out of date and it is stale. And so maintaining the freshness of the data in the map is very challenging given the fact that every day lane markings get repainted, there's road construction, new roads get built. Um, and so this is uh, something that was demonstrated at this year's CES, which is using the imagery from the uh, cameras that are built into a lot of backup cameras and forward cameras on existing vehicles and using uh, comparing the imagery collected of the road surface with a prior map that can be loaded on each car. Uh, and so as the car is um, driving on the road, it can notice street signs, it can notice uh, road signs, it can notice uh, speed markings, lane markings, and then um, when it notices a difference between its prior map and 
uh, the, what it just collected, it can then send that uh, differential information up to the cloud where the cloud can reassemble and stitch together dynamically a, uh, a map of the entire road driving surface. This is a truly scalable way of maintaining a fresh map of the world using the existing vehicles that are already out there. Toyota sells 10 million vehicles a year. Each vehicle lasts about 10 years. That means at any given time, there's 100 million vehicles, Toyota vehicles driving on the road. Uh, and uh, we think that that should be the way that we can uh, crowdsource and gather information. But not only about the, the drivable surfaces and weather conditions and traffic patterns, uh, this will enable a new era of really managing traffic and, and, and managing our cities uh, on a much more uh, uh, scale that will be very productive and really, really exciting. So uh, with that, I'd like to just close with a couple of thoughts. So I am very excited about the next generation of autonomous vehicles that I think will enable all of us to rethink how our urban centers are designed and built. I also think that cloud computing, big data, and machine learning, and the ubiquitous connectivity that is coming uh, will dramatically advance not only the uh, capability of our vehicle autonomy, but also the safety and the access that comes along with it. People who traditionally have not had access to cars, such as people who are uh, visually impaired or blind, uh, can suddenly have mobility, freedom, and transportation uh, on demand and have uh, privacy at the same time. It'll, it'll be truly wonderful. And of course, I think in order to realize this, all of us in this room and many people who are passionate about this need to come together. It'll require cooperation and, and partnerships between the government, the industry, and our academic partners. Uh, we think that is key to having successful solutions. So uh, thank you for your time. I'd, I'd be happy to take a couple of questions if there's uh, any. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Gil Friend, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer for Palo Alto. Oh, great. And we're right with you on most of what you've talked about. Um, I want to quibble with you about hydrogen later on. OK. But, but for now, about autonomous vehicles. We, are, we were just awarded a uh, uh, million dollar grant from Federal Mobility Sandbox to work in a multi-city coalition to pursue some of these ideas here in the Bay Area. And one thing that we really don't understand well is autonomous vehicles. I mean, you suggest that it may reduce congestion. I think that's a logical assumption, but there's also people who assume that it will actually increase congestion because it'll be so frictionless to just, you know, call a robotic car, hop into it, go somewhere, there may be more cars on the road all the time. How do you, how do you weigh those futures and how do you, uh, how do you do the analysis of trying to figure out where we're going with that? Yeah, so uh, that's a very, very good question. And, um, you know, there's lots of different models that, uh, you know, depending on the different assumptions that are made will show different results. But I think the, f the fact is that if you really look at utilization, if you look utilization of vehicles and utilization of seats, um, uh, you can actually meet the needs of point-to-point uh, -point transportation for uh, many, many people uh, with proper ride-sharing and carpooling of these on-demand services uh, that will dramatically reduce the number of cars. The fact is that most places, and Palo Alto's uh, you know, also in that camp, that over 90% of the cars on the road during the peak commute times are, have only a single passenger in them. And uh, I think just that alone uh, is going to reduce the number of vehicles during our peak traffic times. Uh, better utilization, having full seats. You know, a lot of people are going the same place, and they're parking their vehicles in a downtown center. Um, if we can get rid of all the curbside parking and we add more lanes, it's going to dramatically increase traffic throughput. So I'm a very optimistic that uh, you know, with the right set of assumptions, you can, you can easily see that this is going to be a big win. Yes. Hi there. Um, Blaine Merker with Gale. Very exciting possibilities that you presented. Um, I do want to take sort of issue or question with one of them, which is that the best place for vehicles is going to be underground. I think this is kind of a, an, an idea that we explored in the 1930s, and actually cities have been kind of digging out from that idea and trying to uh, create streets that work for people and really mix people together and kind of optimize that friction, optimize the places that people have to be together. And I wonder if that, if you think that the right idea is to really put more vehicles on the road to increase lanes and increase capacity or to right size it so that we can mix traffic together with a more vital public realm. 
That's, that's a very, very good question. Um, you know, for me, at least in my personal experience, walking down pedestrian zones, pedestrian only zones, or when your, your downtown area gets closed on the weekends and you just walk around, it's just so much more pleasant and it's so much safer. Um, and if, you know, it used to be that vehicles underground had a big problem, just like Boston's Big Dig. They had to actually invest in this super expensive HVAC system to suck all the pollution uh, that could congregate in the tunnels. But if we're going to zero emissions vehicles, that is no longer a problem. If everything is electric, that means there is no longer a problem of smog accumulating underground. And instead, you can really have uh, cars going point to point and dropping you off right beneath the place where you need to go, and you take a stair or an elevator up, and then you're above ground, and it's quiet, and it's safe, and it's pollution-free. I, I, I'm, I'm actually really uh, bullish on it. Uh, of course, people have tried it in the 70s, but I think in, in many ways it was ahead of its time. All right, okay. I guess I'm out of time, but thank you so much.